Welcome everybody again. Good. Uh, <laughs> I was threatening to sing, but uh, nobody took me seriously. Uh, okay, well, will come if you sing. <laughs> there will be some movement for sure. Uh, welcome everybody to the afternoon session, and uh, we'll continue with our quick boot camp. Uh, with Parikshit uh, telling us about relations between multi-calibration and loss minimization. Thanks, Umar. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, sounds good. Okay, usually when something runs for five days and it features a lunch break and a break for coffee and tea, and it features somebody with my accent speaking very excitedly on the microphone, it's a cricket match, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, and, you know, after lunch on day one is when the heat sets in, the lunch sets in, it's time for a siesta. So I won't hold it against you if you fall asleep, but, you know, just to stay awake, feel free to interrupt, ask questions, criticize my notation, laugh at my jokes, make your own jokes. It's all good. I have slides, but I don't need to get through all of them. Right? So uh, I'm happy to stop and answer as many questions as there might be. I'm going to talk about multi-group fairness and loss minimization, as promised. And the motivating question here is that Michael talked about these notions of multi-group fairness, right? And as we've seen, these notions, they basically place certain constraints on the behavior of your predictor under certain conditional distributions. And these conditional distributions need to be carefully chosen. But one thing that you won't find here is any explicit notion of a loss function. Right? On the other hand, the ML models that we see all around us and which are used day to day are explicitly trained to minimize a loss function. So the question which motivates us today is to ask, how do these two worldviews relate to each other? Right? This placing constraints in order to ensure various multigroup fairness notions versus this loss minimization viewpoint. Now, Michael, of course, gave you some preview of what's to come here, but let's pretend that, you know, he didn't say anything about this. And there's some real tension here about whether there's some kind of a trade-off, perhaps, between loss minimization and these multi-group fairness notions. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about predictors, just like Michael did in his talk. And just as he said, they are indeed functions from a domain X, which give you probabilities for every point. There's going to be a joint distribution here, D, on points and binary labels. We'll call this nature. The moment you have a joint distribution like this, mathematically, at least, you have this notion of a base optimal predictor, P star, which for every point, it gives you the conditional probability that the label is one. Now, as Michael said, this could be something in our heads. This is nature. You know, We don't make any assumptions about this. For all we know, this is actually a Boolean function, deterministic, right? Like, you know, we'll never be able to tell because all we see is random samples from this distribution. Okay, so this is the Bayes optimal predictor. And the predictors that we'll try and learn are just some other functions, p tilde, which assign probabilities to every point. And p tilde of x is meant to be our estimate for the Bayes optimal predictor. So to draw a picture here, this is the space of all predictors. It is a convex space because, you know, if I have two predictors, I can do convex combinations of them, and that's another predictor. It may not necessarily be a good one, but at least it is a predictor, right? So, and we like convex sets because they're easy to optimize over and so on. Now, the star of this space, the pole star, which Michael with great foresight called P star in his talk, is the Bayes optimal predictor. Right? It is the notion of ground truth for this particular distribution. And the goal of learning at a high level is to come up with some kind of tractable approximation to P star. Now, the point here is that we're not making any assumptions about nature. It could be incredibly complicated. There might be complexity, uh, computational and information theoretic reasons why you can't really learn P star itself. Right? So what we'll try and do is to come up with some kind of practical approximation to P star. And the main weapon we have in our arsenal for doing this is loss minimization, right? You fix a class C, which has a nice tractable description, fix a loss function, 
And then you find the model in the class C, which minimizes this loss. Since this is going to be so central to everything we talk about, even though you've all seen this before, I'm just going to take some time to set this up with uh, some detail. Right? So what is the loss minimization paradigm? It involves three ingredients. There's a distribution D on points and labels. Then there is a class of hypothesis C, which I'm going to, Michael talked about functions from X to the interval zero one. I've written minus one. Oh, I've written minus 1.1. It is meant to be minus one comma one, the interval minus one one. And I'm going to be very loose about this. Sometimes they'll be, they'll generally all be bounded, but we won't worry about what exactly the range is. Right. And finally, you have a loss function. In my way of defining loss functions, they have two parameters T. One is the label Y, which is a binary label. The other parameter T, let's call it the action. This could be a real value. More often than not, these will be probabilities in the range zero one, but we'll just define it in greater generality. Right? So we have these three ingredients. You have a distribution, a hypothesis class, and a loss function. And then what loss minimization tries to do is to find the hypothesis in this class C, which minimizes your expected loss, the expected loss under D of L Y comma C X. Just to check everything type matches because we're allowing for real values here and CX is real value. But this is a very deceptively simple paradigm, which you know, it's extremely powerful. Just look all around us. And a particularly important class of losses are convex losses. So what are convex losses? These are loss functions where for every fixing of Y, which means for Y equals zero and Y equals one, what you get is a convex function in terms of this parameter t. Right? If the loss is convex and your set of predictors is also convex, then loss minimization is in fact, it's you know, provably, it's a tractable problem. Okay. So now some common loss functions, which we are all familiar with, let's just classify them into two broad classes, proper and non-proper losses. Proper losses include things like squared loss and cross entropy loss. The defining property of a proper loss is the following. If I know that Y is actually going to be sampled from the Bernoulli distribution with parameter P, then in order to minimize my expected loss, my best strategy is to say P here. Right? So in that sense, it's proper or truthful. On the other hand, we also use non-proper losses sometimes. The simplest example perhaps is the L1 loss, where the L1 loss on Y and P is the absolute difference. Why is it non-proper? Well, if Y is sampled from a Bernoulli distribution with parameter 0.7, your best strategy is to say one. If it's Bernoulli of 0.3, you say zero. Simple exercise. Logistic loss is another loss function where if the true label is going to be one, you want to say plus infinity. If it's going to be zero, you say minus infinity. If you think it's half and half, you say zero. Right? But there's a large number of loss functions out there. In non-proper losses, if Y is sampled from Bernoulli with probability P, the best action now is just some function of P, but it may not be the identity function anymore. It could be rounding P, it could be doing something exotic, right? Okay. So with this background, let's go back to our uh, original thing that we said the whole goal of learning is to understand the Bayes optimal predictor better and that loss minimization is just a path to this end. So in what sense does loss minimization help us understand the Bayes optimal predictor? Well, firstly, let's imagine that we actually knew P star. Somehow P star happened to be simple or we just got lucky. Now, Loss optimization, it's, you know, it's a breeze. You can optimize loss for any loss function in the world. Doesn't need to be convex, doesn't need to be anything pretty much. Why is that? Well, given a point X, you know that the label is being sampled according to the Bernoulli distribution with parameter P star X. And we just said that when this happens, there is a best action you can take, which is this function KL, this post-processing function, Compose that with P star X, just by the definition of this function K sub L, this is the best thing you can do. Right? In other words, what we are saying is that this composition of KL with P star is the best hypothesis you could possibly have. It beats everything else. 
So this is an extremely strong loss minimization guarantee. And we felt like it deserves a name because it wasn't clear that it had one, right? So in terms of a notion, which I will describe it, I'll define formally at some point, we'll say that P star is an LC omni predictor for all L and C. You know, it just means that it can minimize any loss better than any hypothesis you could possibly come up with. Okay, great. So of course, if you knew P star, you can do loss minimization, but this is, you know, this is, it's a good thought experiment. It's not telling us anything about practical loss minimization because we only minimize over some fixed family of predictors. And, you know, it's, uh, it's very unlikely that this is going to contain P star, right? Okay. So in this setting, how is loss minimization providing us a path to P star? Well, it turns out that when you're minimizing proper loss functions, there's a very concrete geometric argument which supports this intuition. Minimizing a proper loss over C is equivalent to minimizing something called a Bregman divergence between P star and C. Basically the optimal point in C will be the point which is closest to P star in terms of this Bregman divergence. Yeah, thank you. C should have bounded range, but the scale may not have bounded range. Yeah, who said anything about scale? Oh, the case of L. Oh, oh, the case of L. Good point. Good point. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to say something about KL divergence. Yeah, you're you're making a good point here, and we need to make some assumptions that KL doesn't, you know, uh, produce crazy values. And for most loss functions, it won't. Right? Like you can assume that these are the kinds of technical details. I hope nobody in the audience picks on to, but you know. The Simon senior scientist is here to make sure that this talk <laughs> uh, is, uh, yeah, it's a great question. And the answer is that, yes, that's an issue and you have to work carefully, but every loss that you can, you can assume that KL has, it may not be bounded in minus one, one, but it still can be bounded. Great question. Okay. Speaking about KL, the reason I was confused is that the KL is a fantastic example of Bregman divergence, just like squared loss, right? So when you're minimizing the proper loss, what you're doing is actually finding the predictor in C, which is closest to P star in terms of this Bregman divergence. Bregman divergences are not exactly like distances, but you know, for the purposes of this talk, you can think of them as distances, right? So this is nice. This is a really clean geometric explanation for you know, why loss minimization gives you an approximation to P star. The only problem is that if you change your loss function, you've changed the geometry of the space. So now a different point in the set might be the optimal approximation, right? So each loss function comes with its own bespoke geometry and it will give you maybe a different predictor, right? Now, when you talk about non-proper losses, there is no such clean geometric characterization, at least that I am aware of, but I'm no expert here. It's very intuitive to say, however, that when you're minimizing a non-proper loss, you still have to understand something about the base optimal if you want to do well with regard to loss minimization, just because the optimal is, as you've seen, very closely tied to the base optimal predictor. So in this sense, loss minimization is a very concrete and you know, it's a very concrete way to think about approximating P star, but still it leaves you with some feeling that each loss is just telling you some part of the picture. By minimizing a certain loss, you get a hypothesis, which is good at approximating P star in some way. You change the loss, you come up with a different predictor, which approximates P star in some other way. Every loss is giving you like one small piece of the big picture. And there's nothing in the loss minimization paradigm which tells you a coherent way to put all these pieces together and come up with one good global approximation for the base optimal predictor. So this really is the starting point for us. This is the notion of omni-prediction. Is this one predictor that works for all proper No, it doesn't because the geometry changes. When you run linear regression, right, you get the predictor which minimizes the square loss. I encourage you to try this actually. It's very easy to do in something like scikit -learn. You do logistic regression, you get a different predictor which minimizes the logistic loss and so on. And uh, these could be very different things, you know. So a picture would be, you have this convex set. Each loss defines a certain direction, right? So you kind of find the point which is optimal in this particular direction. 
different directions take you to different points. There's no reason why uh, different losses will give you different optimal points. So, uh, even for proper losses. Even for proper losses, because the loss defines the direction. More so is that, is that formal? Like that it's you know in some metric space the loss defines some direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean it's uh, formal, it's empirical, it's everything. Otherwise, we wouldn't have these different algorithms like logistic regression and linear regression and so on, right? And um, yeah, that's actually where this stuff is heading for. Right? There wasn't. There's no reason to take these things into so Different losses give you different optima. You know, these very simple examples will show you this. Oh. So what is omniprediction? Omniprediction is a notion which provides a uniform, a unified path to P star. It's a notion of simultaneous optimality for a family of loss functions. Right? And the main, the main, to give away the punchline of this talk, what we're going to talk about is how you can get omniprediction from multigroup fairness notions, the ones that Michael talked about earlier this morning. And then they're going to ask, well, this is kind of bizarre. Why did multigroup fairness show up in a setting where we're just talking about minimizing loss functions? Is there some inherent reason for this? Are there reverse connections between notions of omniprediction and multigroup fairness? And along the way, as um, uh, you know, as advertised, you'll see a bunch of connections to notions like outcome indistinguishability, internal and swap regret from online learning and agnostic learning. All right, so um, if there's no questions at this point, let's dive into what an omnipredictor is. So this is uh, based on joint work with uh, Batsal Sharan, Omar Reingold, Udi Wieder, uh, who are all here today, and Adam Kalai, who's supposed to be here. I was looking forward to it because this is pandemic work, so this would probably be the first time that the authors are all in the same room together. Uh, but let's see. So what is an omnipredictor? So there are, two param there are two parameters here. There is L, which is a family of loss functions, and C, which is a hypothesis class. So an LC omnipredictor, it is a predictor such that for any loss in this family L, the expected loss you suffer when you do the, op the optimal post-processing of your predictions, is less than the expected loss suffered by any hypothesis in C, including the single best hypothesis. So if you're bothered by the scale thing, let's just think about proper losses. Pretend that KL is the identity function. So now this is exactly the thing that Sumega was asking for. It's one predictor which does as well as the best hypothesis in C for any loss from this family L. So what is really the, what is the crux of this notion? The crux of this notion is that on the left, this omnipredictor, we just learn it once. At that point, we do not know what specific loss we are going to be asked to minimize beyond the fact that it belongs to this family L. So we have our data, we do our learning, then we are done. On the right-hand side though, we are comparing against the best hypothesis in C which could be tailored to that particular loss. In fact, if you want to use the toolbox of convex optimization, every time you have a different loss, you need to solve a different convex problem because really the optima might be different, right? So we learn once for all of L. After that, all we care about is the only reason to know about L is to know what post-processing to do, but our predictions have been made. We just need to know, should I round P? Should I do something else with it, right? but we are able to compete against an algorithm which could be tailoring C to the specific choice of loss function L. So that is what is the power of this notion. Um, okay. It's a powerful notion, but uh, do you have a question, Abhishek? Okay. Uh, so uh, we should interpret your answer to Sumega's earlier question as, this is by definition an improper notion, right? Uh, yes, I mean, not, it's very likely to be an improper notion, let's say. Uh, I, I don't know about by definition, and we've come to ask me this at the end of the talk. But it seems very likely that it should be improper. Oh, now we know such omnipredictors. Okay, I think Abhishek is making an important point, which is that we're not going to restrict our predictor to belong to the class C. So this is typical in agnostic learning. This is what we call improper learning, that you compete against C, 
but you can allow yourself a bit more computational power. So do these creatures exist? Well, we've already seen the answer to that. P star is an omnipredictor for all L and C. So the real question here is of efficiency, both computational and sample complexity theoretic. Can we efficiently learn omnipredictors for rich classes of L and C? Right? So to just set some baseline for what we should expect in terms of the hardness of this task, Let's ask what happens in the case when L contains only a single loss, like say the squared loss. Right? Now we are exactly in the setting of agnostic learning for C with regard to some loss function L. So this notion that we're proposing is at least as hard as agnostic learning. And so if you're not able to do even just agnostic learning for C, it seems very unlikely that you'll be able to have omniprediction. So is the notion clear? So uh, yeah, Venkat. Exact bound no slack factors. Uh, just to make the talk simple, there are slack factors and I'm sweeping them under the carpet. Uh, yeah, but there is some alpha here also. Okay, fantastic. So now I'm going to make this very abrupt segue into multi accuracy and multi calibration, which are these multi group fairness notions, which Michael did a great job of explaining. So I, you know, he also was kind enough to use almost exactly the same notation. But just to remind those of you who may not have been here this morning, a predictor is C alpha multi accurate if no hypothesis in C has correlation alpha or more with the residual function. The residual function is the labels y minus the predictions p hat. Look at the correlation between C and these residues. If this correlation is small, then you're C alpha multi accurate. C alpha multi-calibration is the stronger notion where you measure correlation conditioned on a particular prediction value. Fix a prediction value like 0.7, measure the correlation, and now you take the expectation, the outer expectation is over the distribution of predictions. Okay, so I, this is great. I don't need to say anything about this because Michael already did such a nice job of it. This notion, as we've seen, is efficiently achievable using a weak agnostic learner for C. And of course, it doesn't explicitly mention loss anywhere. But the main result in this work, I think the main contribution, of course, is the definition of omnipredictors, which is a notion which is very natural. The main result is that if P is C multi-calibrated, then it is an omnipredictor for L convex comma lin C. What is L convex? It's the set of all convex Lipschitz loss functions. This is pretty much every loss function that we care about in machine learning. Right? Lin C is just linear combinations of C. It's all combinations of the form summation lambda I C I. Now in reality, I should bound the L1 norm of this combination, but you know, for this talk, I will not do that. So if P is, if a predictor is C multi-calibrated, it is an L convex Lin C omnipredictor where L convex is the set of all convex loss functions. Okay, so when you see a theorem like this, maybe a good exercise to do is to ask, you know, what is this really telling us? Is it telling us something interesting? Like what are, we're talking about binary loss, we're talking about binary labels. So are there really a number of interesting loss functions out there and interesting algorithms for them that we are able to compete against? Well, let's list some of them. If you wanted to minimize squared loss, which is of course convex and nice, you would do linear regression, L2 regression. If you wanted to do L1, if you wanted to minimize the L1 loss instead of the L2 loss, you'd write a linear program for that. Why might you want to minimize the L1 loss? Well, there's this classic paper of Kalai, Clivens, Mansur, and Servadio on agnostically learning half spaces which made the point that L1 regression is often less noise sensitive than L2 regression. So there are things you can do with L1 regression that you cannot do with L2 regression. Okay. If you wanted to do logistic loss, you'd run logistic regression. If you wanted to uh, do minimize exponential loss, you'd run Adabus, the famous algorithm of Freund and Shapire. I could go on and on. Well, actually, no, I don't know any other loss functions, but I'm, <laughs> I'm sure there's other loss functions out there that people have, just, uh, have thought about. The point is now, just by running the multi-calibration algorithm and then doing the right process, post-processing, 
you can compete against each of these algorithms for their chosen loss, and you're doing at least as well. So that's the power of this result. And also, the statement is fairly tight in the sense that convexity is important here. You cannot, multi-calibration by itself does not imply omnipredictors for arbitrary non-convex loss functions, even if they are Lipschitz. Right? So just what I mean is that we have examples of non-convex loss functions, which are nicely Lipschitz and so on, for which you wouldn't get an omnipredictor from multi-calibration. Right? So this connection is pretty tight. Are there any questions about the statement? Okay, thank you. Yes. Comment on YC here and Lin C there. There's some oh, just it makes it more powerful. Oh, that's okay. why. You know, if I just said that I'm doing a weak agnostic learner, you know, I'm assuming a weak agnostic learner for C, the power of something like beta boost comes from taking linear combinations of hypotheses. Right? So just, you know, in some sense, there's no difference between multi calibration for C and Lin C. One implies the other with some loss of parameters. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, could you comment on beyond you know uh, issues with you know optimization? Uh, why non convexity sort of breaks the connection? Uh, no, I'm as puzzled about it as <laughs> as anyone else. So, ask me this question again because we're going to you know I'll have I'll try and say something about it. I don't guarantee that it will be interesting or enlightening, but we'll say something more about it. Is the the success? Necessary here, or just like some slower semi continuity or something, or it's, it's, and that's even more puzzling than convexity. Yeah. Okay, great. I'll, I'll show you a sketch of the proof where you can, uh, you know, I'll tell you exactly where each of these things come in, and then maybe there's other things you can do which are weaker than Lipschitz. Yes. Uh, so I don't know, but that's partly because I don't know what the semi continuity is. So let's go through the proof and we'll see where the truth has come. Um, so I'm going to, so just because, you know, really the main message here is not the truth, so it's really about the statement. But just because this connection between multigroup fairness and loss minimization seems to come out of the blue, I think it, it's good to see the proof at least at a high level to get some sense of why multi-calibration even should enter the picture here. So I'm going to do this proof under some simplifying assumptions. I'm going to assume P star is Boolean just because it makes it easier for me to draw pictures. I'm going to assume perfect multi-calibration. Perfect multi-calibration means that I don't even allow an alpha error here. I just assume that for all prediction values V of the predictor, there is no correlation between anything in C and the residual function. None of these are really needed, of course. It's just to make our life simple here. Okay, so let's fix a prediction value V, a loss L, and a hypothesis C, okay? So I'm going to show you an impressionistic sketch of the proof. Okay. So here is we are focusing on the regions where a predictor predicts the value 0.7. So this could be a large set of points. And since the base optimal predictor is Boolean, the true uh, base optimal for each point is either one or zero. So in some sense, point wise, our predictor is wrong everywhere, right? It's saying 0.7. It's saying, I can't tell the difference between these points. They all look the same to me. But because it's calibrated, at least we know that 70% of the time, the label is one, 30% of the time, the label is zero, right? This is the extent to which our predictor is correct. And that's all. Okay. Now, C is trying to compete against this predictor. And C, of course, doesn't need to you know, output just one value everywhere, right? The whole advantage that C has is that it can assign different values to different points. If you're trying to, for instance, minimize the squared loss, you're hoping that C is very close to one here and closer to zero over here, right? So C gets to output different values on different points, right? But it turns out that actually C, you don't get that much of an advantage by using a bunch of different values. You could just be using two values instead. This is where convexity comes in. This is by Jensen's inequality. If we fix the points where the ground truth label is one, now the loss we pay is one fixed convex function, like one minus t squared, right? And now Jensen's inequality tells us that instead of outputting a whole bunch of values, if you just output the expectation of those values, your expected loss will be less. So I can take all these red values, 
replace them by their conditional expectation when the label is one. Similarly, I can take all these blue values, replace them by the conditional expectation when the label is zero. Right? Now notice that here I had to condition on the label in order to fix the loss function to be one particular convex function. I cannot just you know, replace everything by the expectation. Except that by multi-calibration, it turns out I can. It turns out that these two expectations here, they're actually the same number, which is the expectation of C everywhere. And this is because of multi-calibration. Multi-calibration tells us that there's no correlation between C and the labels Y. And if these conditional expectations of C were different, condition on the label being one and the label being zero, well, it smells like correlation, right? And you just, you know, you do the calculation and it is exactly correlation. So the fact that multi-calibration means there's no correlation exactly means that these two expectations are the same. They're just the expectation of C. Let me just finish this and we'll, yeah. And uh, Nati, this is where the convex, the Lipschitzness is important because in general, these two values, they will not be exactly the same. They'll be close together. And then you want to argue that by shifting these values to C, you don't change the loss function very much. So this is because of the delta or? Sorry? With the alpha or? Yeah, yeah. Ah, no, with the alpha you need Lipschitz. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But your, your claim before I thought was. Yeah. Pretty yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. No, okay, that, uh, yes. I, I, here we don't need Lipschitz. But now if we reduce C to the point where it's just using the same value at every point in the space. But now the omni predictor has one. Because if you're going to output the same value at every point in the space, then from the point of view of this predictor, it looks like the labels are being generated as Bernoulli with parameter 0.7, because 70% of the time you see the label one, 30% of the time you see the label zero. So there is no better single value than what the omni predictor outputs, which is K sub L of 0.7. Right? Okay. So that's, um, any questions, Sunaiva? Yes, so I was a bit confused that why can't we correlate with C, right? What if Y is being generated by some, Plus. Yeah, but then this partition wouldn't be multi calibrated. We make this argument for a multi calibrated predict. So there's just condition on some V. Yeah. Condition on the prediction value. That's very important. There cannot be any correlation between C and the label. That's the promise of multi calibration. Oh, great. So, so, so yeah. It seems that these for convex losses here, you only used multi. No, no, no. See, the condition on the prediction, that's the whole difference between multi-accuracy and multi-calibration. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's very important. Multi-accuracy wouldn't be. It wouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Okay. Yeah, good question. Okay. So, and I just want to make the observation that we got a little more than we advertised at first. What we claim is that for all losses and Cs, the omni predictor will do better than the hypothesis C, right? But if you look at the proof carefully, what we said is let's fix a prediction value. Now we can deal with any loss as long as it comes from the family L, any hypothesis as long as it belongs to the family C. And conditioned on this prediction value, our omni predictor is doing better than this hypothesis on this loss function. So you could imagine an adversary who comes to know what the omni predictor is going to predict and then issues a challenge saying, I'm going to use this loss and I'm going to use this hypothesis. Doesn't help, the omni predictor will still beat you, right? So this is a slight strengthening. I'm just going to observe this and then you know, leave this thread hanging. We'll come back to it at the end if we have time to you know, talk about reverse connections and so on. So let's go back to our original picture where we said that loss minimization is giving us a certain path to approximating the base optimal. But then we said that every different loss function is suggesting its own path. There's no unifying notion here. Now I claim that omni prediction and multi calibration are giving us such a unified picture, at least in the setting of convex losses. <coughs> because effectively what it's saying is that you can find this one predictor P tilde which is multi-calibrated such that you should think of it as no matter what loss function you choose, the shortest path from P star to C will pass through P tilde, right? 
So it's this one predictor, which is simultaneously on the shortest path from P star to C for any convex loss function. And um, so, yeah, so P tilde, it need not belong to the class C, but you know, it's this one predictor, which is as good as anything in C, no matter what loss you decide you care about. So this picture here, it looks like slideware, right? Like uh, how many people have heard of slideware? Okay, I'm showing my, uh, the number of years I've spent in corporate research. What is the most common programming language out there? Paperware? PowerPoint. <laughs> Slideware is software which lives on PowerPoint and never, you know, migrates to another programming language. So this picture, it does look like Slideware, but actually there is a formal theorem. You can exactly formalize this and you can, the language that you use is Pythagorean theorems in Bregman divergence. You can actually prove that, for instance, the squared distance between P star and anything in C is the sum of the squared distances between P star and P tilde and the squared distance between P tilde and that predictor in C, right? So Russell in the previous talk was asking this question of whether for squared loss, this omni predictor, the multi-calibrated solution could do much better than the hypothesis in C. The answer is yes. This is a measure of how much better it does. If it's far away from C, it's doing much, much better. Okay, great. So what we've seen so far is that multi-calibration, it gives us the strong notion of loss minimization called omniprediction for all convex loss functions. Uh, and Omer likes to think about this as a good karma kind of statement because he swears to me that when they were working on multi-calibration, they had no thoughts about minimizing any kind of loss. So the fact that it gives you a really strong loss minimization guarantee, that's really nice and it's really surprising. It was surprising to us. But this connection that I've shown you is a little, you know, it's a little fortuitous in the following sense. What if for some reason I decide that I care about all losses, not just convex ones? Or what if I decide that all convex losses are, you know, that's too much for me. I just care about proper losses or LP losses, or maybe just L1 loss and L2 loss, right? Can I do anything easier than multi-calibration for that? This theorem, it gives us this one very strong connection, but it doesn't say anything about the general notion of omniprediction. And the other thing, okay, so the other thing is, uh, sorry, it's quite natural to wonder whether this is indeed the right proof. Could there be a simpler explanation of this omniprediction phenomenon through the lens of outcome indistinguishability as Michael presented this morning, right? The story that this predictor is indistinguishable from P star and P star is an omnipredictor. So this is an omnipredictor. It's a very appealing story. Right? So could this be the real explanation for what's going on? You know, speaking not for my co-authors, but just personally for me, any proof that hinges on a clever application of Jensen's inequality should be treated with a great deal of suspicion. I constantly live in fear that somebody is going to email me and say, hey, you had the direction of inequality wrong. But, uh, it hasn't happened so far. Okay. But these are ample reasons. These are all good reasons to ask if there's a different explanation for what we've seen here in terms of outcome indistinguishability. I should mention that the connection between outcome indistinguishability and loss minimization was explored in this prior work of Rothblum and Yuna but they weren't coming at it from the omni-prediction viewpoint. So they didn't ask for just one predictor that works for all loss functions like we will. Abhishek? Uh, I'll try. Uh, um, okay. So can we interpret um, this Pythagoras theorem as the following? Uh, probably should be. Uh, so we can take the hull of all, all like you vary P star, and you uh, take these projections, take the set, uh, set of all, like you'll get another convex set. Now, if you do loss minimization with respect to that convex set, uh, because with respect to a proper loss, now you're projecting P star onto that convex set. Is that a common state? I mean, it's I don't have an answer to you, but it sounds like a fantastic summer project. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's talk about it. I, the, I sounds possible. <laughs> No, no, no. There are many, many, many multi-calibrated predictors. 
of course, because like P star is, but I mean, somehow I thought that you said there's a so. So is there a kind of unique P tilde that's closest to that gives this? Not that I know. Ah, not that I know. No, no. It's a local multi calibration is kind of a local condition. You know, it's, uh, there's no canonical multi calibrated predictor that we could arrive at. P star is. No, P star always is right, but I thought there's like the one. Oh, that's kind of P star. Okay, fine. P star is a multi calibrated. Yeah, but, that's but right. Is there, can I kind of define a P tilde that it's closest to C, the one that like uh, that, that doesn't, you know, that, that satisfies? I saw that someone using this Pythagorean property. No, this Pythagorean property, that's what's kind of or confusing anything. about it. There could be many P tildes and this right, Pythagorean like anything property. Anything between P tilde and P star would satisfy, but there's no, but, but I, okay, so there's no notion of like most. Not that I know. No, no. There's no canonical way of, uh, yeah. Well, this it seems to be. Like this, oh, the set of uh, one calibrated. Look at it, it's not convex. It's not a convex set, that's very that's important. True, but it doesn't have to be. Anyway, so I, I don't think there's a nice simple way to make a canonical multi calibrated predictor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you say more about the KL? Is it very easy to get? Yeah, I won't say more about it actually, but for any loss function, there are explicit forms you can write for it. You know, it's as simple as the loss, basically, right? Yeah. The important thing is just it's just a univariate transformation. It needs to know nothing about the data or the distribution. Okay. We're doing great. So now let's talk about whether there's an explanation for this through the lens of outcome indistinguishability. So outcome indistinguishability. So it's this beautiful work by Dwork, Kim, Reingold, Rothblum, and Yona, where they present a, you know, a fresh perspective on this classic question of what does it mean for a predictor P tilde to be correct? And the answer, which is very natural in hindsight, is that the predicted outcomes of this predictor are indistinguishable from nature. So this is formulated as Michael showed us in the language of distinguishers. And the whole challenge that we have in the OA model is to tell whether you are in the matrix or in reality, right? So the, you know, nature is reality and the matrix is called the simulation. When you are in nature, your labels Y star are being generated according to nature's distribution. The simulation, is the world in which your predictor P tilde is the base optimum. So when my predictor says 0.7, I actually toss a coin, which is heads with probability 0.7, and I output that label, right? So this is going to be very important throughout, right? That in the simulated world, we already have the base optimal predictor. It is our predictor P tilde. So the distinguisher, I'm going to allow it to be a real valued bounded function in the interval minus one, one. We say that the distinguisher wins if its expectation under these two distributions is different. Then it managed to tell apart nature and the simulation. If the distinguisher loses, then the predictor has won. It's managed to fool the distinguisher. So the main result in this paper was that indistinguishability, as we saw, relates to various notions of multigroup fairness. I'm going to use two restricted forms of this. I'm never going to give the distinguisher X, the prediction, and the label altogether. I give the label and one of these other two things. In the model where you only show X and Y to the distinguisher, indistinguishability is related to multi-accuracy. The model where you only show the prediction and Y to the distinguisher, this is an incredibly weak model, which is probably the reason why it wasn't considered in this original paper. There's not much you can do. You're just seeing a prediction value, you're seeing a label. All you can do is check calibration. And that's the complete notion of indistinguishability for this model, right? If your predictor is calibrated, you cannot tell the simulation apart from nature. This model seems really weak, but if you're interested in this question of what is the right notion of calibration, how do we define it in higher dimensions and so on, then this model becomes important. And if you're curious about this, I suggest you look at this upcoming stock paper or talk to Lun Jia Hu, which, who is here in the audience. Okay. So this is outcome indistinguishability. What we're going to do now is try and see if we can come up with an OI-based proof of this notion of omniprediction, right? So the key, the key objects that OI studies are distinguishers. So what we're going to do is they're going to come up with a family of distinguishers based on L and C. There's no suspense here. Michael showed us how to do this. These distinguishers will compare the loss that C suffers on a particular loss L 
with the loss, the Omni predictor suffers right, on the same loss. Omni prediction is basically saying that the expectation of these distinguishers is positive, or at least non negative, under nature's distribution. Omni prediction is purely a statement about nature's distribution. It doesn't care about the simulation. The proof that we just saw didn't make any mention of the simulation. But this positivity condition, it's very easy to prove in the simulation. It's easy to prove for the simple reason that we know the Bayes optimal predictor in the simulated world. It is the predictor P tilde. Now, loss OE, if we can enforce it, will ensure that these two dis the, that the expectation of the distinguisher under these two distributions is the same, right? So that is what loss OE does. Given a family of distinguishers, it ensures that you know, a predictor which is loss OE uh, ensures that the expectation of the distinguisher under these two distributions is the same. If we can ensure this, we are done. Why are we done? The expectation is positive under the simulation. We said that this is easy to prove. We want omni prediction, which is positivity of the expectation under nature's distribution. And if these expectations are equal, one is positive, the other is also positive. So conceptually, at least, this is a very simple and transparent way to get to the notion of omni prediction. The question is whether this is actually going to work, right? Um, the point here is that we only wanted positivity of this expectation. That's what omni prediction is. But because we're encoding it in the language of loss OE, we're going to ask for something stronger. We're going to say that these two expectations are actually going to be equal. So if this expectation is one, we want the other expectation to be one. If it's 0.5, we want that to be 0.5. So we are enforcing a much stronger condition than positivity. Okay, so let's, uh, you know, just, Michael has done some of this already. So I just, you know, give this, this previous slide, it basically covers the entire idea of what we're trying to do, but let's just go through it in a bit more of detail. So we're going to come up with this family of distinguishers, which Michael called D and I'll call something else, which basically compare the loss that is suffered by C on your labels. So this is what omni prediction is, right? Omni prediction is saying that C suffers more loss than my omni predictor. Yeah. Just to move this into the language of the last slide, this is what you mean when you say positivity. Like that's this equation. Positivity is something greater than or equal to zero. Yes. yes. Yeah. Oh yes, yes. So that's what I want, right? So we, we compared these two expectations by linearity, I can write it as positivity of a certain quantity. So now we have a distinguisher. It's exactly this. It compares the loss of C with the loss of the omni predictor. Omni prediction is asking that the expectation be positive when the labels are generated according to nature. What we do know is that the expectation is positive under the simulation, right? And this is very easy to see. It's basically because we have the Bayes optimal predict. Loss OI will ensure that the expectation of this quantities of all these tests is the same whether you generate labels according to nature or according to the simulation, and therefore it will imply omni prediction. So we are asking for something stronger. So it's, you know, it's not something we know how to do, but you know, there are all these equivalences equ which equate OI to a very, some kind of multigroup fairness. So by working through that, you should get a statement saying some kind of multigroup fairness will give you omni prediction. So that uh, multigroup fairness condition, it turns out to be something called calibrated multi-accuracy, which is intermediate between multi-accuracy and multi-calibration. So let's just walk through it, right? Like here's our test. It has these two parts and we're looking at the expectation of this. The natural thing to do is just say that the expectation of these two parts individually stay the same under both distributions. So you say that the expected loss suffered by my omni predictor stays the same, whether the labels are generated by nature or the simulation. You also say that the loss suffered by CX stays the same, whether the labels are generated according to nature or by my omni predictor. This first condition, it's very easy to get. It comes from calibration because it's an OE condition where the distinguisher is only looking at labels and predictions, nothing else. The second condition, it's some kind of multi-accuracy condition. Again, because we're not looking at the predictions here. We are only looking at the labels and at the point X itself. 
Now, what multi-accuracy condition it is, we don't need to worry about that. It's something, multi-accuracy for some class, which depends both on L and on C. It's not just dependent on C alone. Okay, that's good. But is this going to give us an interesting omniprediction statement, right? Because the whole point we wanted was independence from the loss function. It turns out, and I won't tell you exactly how, that yes, it does give you many interesting omniprediction style statements for GLM losses. So these are a family of losses closely related to proper losses. They include linear logistic loss, squared loss, and many more things. It turns out that C prime actually doesn't depend on L. It's equal to C. So for this class, all you need is calibrated multi-accuracy, which is just calibration plus C multi-accuracy. So this is something intermediate between multi-accuracy and multi-calibration. And this has a very easy algorithm, which I won't tell you. It's much simpler than multi-calibration. For Lipschitz losses, which may not even be convex, it turns out you can take C prime to be thresholds of C, right? So if you don't care about convexity, you just have Lipschitz losses, you can get omniprediction even for those things. What you will not find here is a simpler statement or an alternative proof for the case of convex losses. There's a very good reason for that. C multi-calibration, while it gives you omniprediction for convex losses, it actually does not give you loss OI. This is a stronger condition. You cannot get it just from multi-calibration. And in retrospect, with the benefit of hindsight, I would say that this hope of finding a different proof of that statement through the lens of outcome indistinguishability, in my opinion, it was both technically and morally flawed because convexity is crucial to that statement. It's not true if you allow for losses that are not convex. And in indistinguishability, you know, there are experts in the audience here. I've never seen any examples where convexity is the thing which you know, makes or breaks the statement. So I'd welcome a different proof, but I don't think it's likely. Okay. So just to summarize, to compare loss OI and omniprediction, omniprediction just compares your omnipredictor with the hypothesis in C. As long as it does better, you're okay, right? So it's like these balance scales here. You can tell which is better, but you don't care by how much. In loss OI, we replace this with a digital device and we're able to measure exactly how much the omnipredictor is better by. And now we want this to exactly equal what we see in the simulation, right? no less and no more. So this is very natural if you're thinking about it from the point of view of indistinguishability, of course, but therefore it gives you an incomparable condition to omniprediction. It's a stronger guarantee, but you also pay for it in the sense that you might need a stronger multigroup fairness notion in order to ensure it. Okay. So I think I have about five minutes left. So now in these last five minutes, let me just ask the question, we started off with this notion of omniprediction, which I think is a perfectly reasonable standalone notion. And we keep running into these various notions of multigroup fairness. Why does this happen? Is there some inherent connection between multigroup fairness and omniprediction? Right? So a recent work by uh, Omer, Michael, and me, it actually shows that there is an equivalence. This equivalence requires one extra ingredient. That's the notion of swapping. So maybe I'll just tell you what these notions are and then we'll stop. So what we show is an equivalence between L convex C swap omniprediction and C swap multi-calibration. These swap notions, they are inspired by the notions of swap regret from the classic works of Foster Vora and uh, Blum Mansur. So what is swap multi-calibration? We say a predictor satisfies C alpha swap multi-calibration if the expectation of the max of a certain quantity, yada, yada, is small, right? So what we're doing here is that for every conditioning on the prediction value, we pick the best hypothesis from C, right? It's not a single C that we compare across all conditionings. For each conditioning, we pick the best and we say, this should not exhibit too much correlation. How is this different from the standard notion? Basically, we switch the max and expectation around. Now we are looking at this and saying, oh, this is just some technical modification to the definition and you'd be exactly right. That is what it is. All the known algorithms that we know, both of them, they actually give you swap multi-calibration. 
right? Because uh, this is how they work. You condition on a particular value, you make sure there's no correlation. Moreover, even if this were not the case, the two notions are equivalent up to polynomial and alpha factors. When alpha equals zero, they are identical. So for all practical purposes, we can consider these two notions to be identical. Right? You'll hear more about this in Rachel's talk later in this workshop. What is swap omniprediction? Unlike swap multi-calibration, which is just a technical modification of multi-calibration, swap omniprediction is a stronger notion. It's the notion that we already saw when we said the proof gave us something more. So here we imagine sampling an XY pair according to nature's distribution. X is shown to the predictor. The predictor makes their prediction. We then show this prediction to an adversary and the adversary is allowed to choose a loss and a hypothesis to respond to that loss, which knows about the prediction value V. And now the adversary suffers their loss based on this hypothesis. The predictor suffers their loss based on the omni predictor. We compare them. And we say that P is an LC swap omni predictor if it's still able to beat every adversary of this kind. So it's a provably stronger notion than just standard omni prediction, right? And what we prove in this result, what we prove in this work is that. C swap multi-calibration is in fact equivalent to L convex C swap omniprediction. So forget the swap here because they're basically equivalent. C multi-calibration is equivalent to swap omniprediction for convex loss functions, right? So this is a characterization. Why is this interesting? Well, it tells us that, you know, although, you know, they said that they, they said that when they worked on multi-calibration, they weren't thinking about loss minimization, they lied, right? Multi-calibration is basically the same notion as a very strong omni-prediction notion, which is swap omni-prediction for convex losses. The other thing which is nice, I think, is that it extends this view from the classic work of Foster and Bora, which connects calibration with regret, right? So Foster and Bora in their paper, they say a lot of very, interesting and intelligent things. One of them is that you can think of calibration as not having swap regret for the class of constant hypotheses. So when I say 0.3, I don't feel regret that I should have said 0.2 instead in order to minimize my squared loss. What this theorem tells us is that you can think of C multi-calibration as not having swap regret for the richer class of strategies coming from the class C. So again, when I say 0.3, I don't wish that I'd instead use maybe a decision tree of some depth or a neural network, depending on what C is, in place of my prediction. It wouldn't make much of a difference. Okay, so let me just conclude by summarizing all these different notions of omniprediction that we've talked about. We started off with just the classic notion of omniprediction. We introduced this notion of loss OI, and we said that this is stronger than omniprediction. We introduced the notion of swap omniprediction, and we said, look, even this is stronger than omniprediction. And when you look at a picture like this, you wonder whether there's something on top here. There is, it's the swap analog of loss OI. I won't tell you what that is, but it turns out that this also has an exact characterization in terms of multi-calibration except that the class C prime now depends on the loss L as well. What this picture tells us is that swap notions of omniprediction are very tightly characterized by multigroup fairness notions. So if you wanted to know whether there is an inherent connection between multigroup fairness and omniprediction, the answer is definitely yes for the swap notions. What this does not tell us is whether multi-calibration was indeed necessary for this omniprediction result for convex losses that we started with. In fact, multi-calibration is giving you something stronger. It's giving you swap omniprediction. So it's very tempting to think that maybe if you don't care about the swap aspect, there might be simpler ways to get it. Not that I know how to do it, but it's entirely plausible. Right? Okay. So I think I'm out of time and I'm out of slides. So it's a happy coincidence. Uh, what we've seen so far is that Omniprediction, it's this natural notion. It turns out to have this tight connection to multi-calibration for convex losses. Loss OI, it's a notion of omniprediction, a stronger notion inspired by outcome indistinguishability. 
It's connected to its own multigroup fairness notion called calibrated multi-accuracy. And we've seen some connections in the reverse direction. There's tight connections between swap notions of omni prediction and some multigroup fairness notions. So um, I'm going to skip this last slide I had. Let me just say that Adam is giving a talk tomorrow, which um, we should all attend. It'll be very interesting. I hope he's here. Uh, so in summary, multigroup fairness and loss minimization, the main subjects of this talk, they are intimately connected, not just to each other. There are all these nice connections to outcome indistinguishability, online learning, regret minimization, and many other things. This is a very active area of research. There's new connections being discovered. And I'm really excited to see a lot of these talks in this conference. I won't list them all out, but you know, uh, there's a bunch of them. And what is the general goal that we as a community are building towards? I think the goal here is to have rigorous, interpretable, and practical methods for multigroup fairness. They need to be rigorous because this is who we are as a community. They need to be interpretable because as we've seen, uh, with differential privacy, users having trust in the notion is very important. And um, they need to be practical because we do want to impact the world as it is out there. So with that, I just want to say that, you know, the ideas that I presented here are, uh, you know, they are borrowed from a bunch of wonderful co-authors and colleagues, and I want to acknowledge them all. And thank you very much for your attention. Since we're a bit late, unless there is a quick question, we can make it off that and we get to the Let's take a, a coffee break. In half an hour, we have another. We'll have